Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome, Mayor Pete. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So I was going to say welcome to rural Nevada, but now I'm saying welcome to rural America. We have how many locations? 20. We have 20 locations in seven states today, and we're just so pleased that you're joining us. You've got a great team, and you know we look forward to having a conversation and just enjoying this today. Thank you for being here so much. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in touch with uh, so many folks in so many places and, and looking forward to what I know is going to be a great conversation. So what we do normally is we go ahead and let the candidate just go ahead and open up. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you know, know more about you than I know about you. So we'll let you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself. And then when you get a point, you say, hey, I want, um, um, I'm okay with some That's questions. Hard. To talk about what's motivating me to run, and then I'll, I'll try to keep it compact so that we can spend as much time as possible on on questions. First of all, again, thanks for taking the time and, and the effort to bring us together. And thanks for being so engaged in, in the future, because I believe this is an even more urgent moment than many of us realize. I think we all know that we cannot survive as a republic, at least the one that we know, with another term of this president. But I also think that uh, this presidency is a symptom of some deeper issues that have been impacting our country for a very long time. And if we're not dealing with the fundamental ways in which uh, the so-called normal has let us down, then I think we're in for even more challenges in the years ahead. So what, what's motivating me to run is the knowledge that we need ideas that are bold enough to deal with the problems before us as a country, and we gotta find a way to do it that unifies Americans because we are also dangerously divided and polarized and doubtful. At the very moment, we've got to tackle some of the biggest challenges we've ever had. We got an economy where right now, the GDP is going up, stock market's going up, life expectancy is going down. That shouldn't even be possible. But that tells you what happens when we got an economy that doesn't work for us, even when it's growing, let alone when we're dealing with a recession. We got a climate that is increasingly approaching the point that scientists have warned us is a point of no return not as some distant future far off challenge, but as something happening today and about to get much worse. Uh, we've got escalating gun violence. Uh, we've got an immigration crisis that I think has been created by cruelty and incompetence in Washington. And we're running out of time to deal with it. I also think we can deal with it if we are ready to take bold action and do it now. And I believe in order to bring Americans together around the actions we've got to take, we've got to organize in terms of our values, values that have uh, often been monopolized by the Republican Party, um, but are actually American values with progressive implications. And I'll give you a few examples. One of them is patriotism. Now, the patriotism coming from this White House uh, would have you think that all there is to loving our country is to hug the flag. And, uh, and tell some people that uh, uh, if they're not loyal to the president, they ought to uh, go home to where they came from. My understanding of patriotism is a little bit different because when I was serving in uniform, I was serving with Americans from every different walk of life, different races, different politics for sure, and we were trusting each other with our lives in service of something bigger than ourselves. If we want to talk about national security right now, we got to look at what that actually means in the 21st century. Keeping Americans safe right now means keeping Americans safe from gun violence, not allowing the Second Amendment to be twisted into an excuse to prevent common sense reforms that all of us want, even Republicans and gun owners, like universal background checks and red flag laws, and making sure that we're doing something about assault weapons and high capacity magazines. We can do that right now and we've got to. If we're serious about national security, we've got to face the fact that climate is a national security challenge, uh, that literally lives are endangered if we don't act on, on climate change. And I'm not just talking about uh, the, the coasts. This is happening in different ways in different parts of the country. Country, including in the Midwest where I live, 
my own city has had extreme flooding, sort of thing that's supposed to happen once every thousand years or so. And it's happened twice during, just during my time as mayor. Uh, that is a national security challenge. White nationalist violence is a security challenge before us in the 21st century. And none of these challenges are gonna be met using a 17th century security technology, like building a wall. It's not gonna be that easy. It's gonna require more from us. That's my vision of national security, and also one where the United States is respected. Our credibility abroad protects American lives at home, but that means a president who is known to keep the word of this country, because when we don't, our allies take note and our adversaries take note. I also think a lot of other values that are, uh, something that mean a lot, especially in rural America, uh, have been made partisan, but shouldn't have to be. Faith is a good example. Now, I talk about faith carefully because we need to stand for people of any religion and of no religion equally. That's part of the basic idea of America. But I think now is also a good time to remind voters who are guided by faith that they have a choice. Certainly the, the faith, the Christian faith tradition that I belong to teaches that we are responsible for lifting up the marginalized among us, that we are supposed to take care of the least among us, that we are to feed the hungry and clothe the sick, that we're supposed to welcome the stranger, and stranger is another word for immigrant, uh, that this is part of our moral responsibility. And every moral tradition I know of teaches that. It also teaches us to seek out leaders who walk in the way of humility and decency. And that means that, that by no means does any religion, especially Christian faith, require you to be on board with what's going on in the White House right now. We have a choice. And we should be talking about those values as a way to bring Americans together instead of allowing religion to be used as a weapon to tell some people they don't belong. I think one of the most basic values in this country is freedom. And freedom is something that, that shouldn't be partisan either. Look, sometimes freedom means getting government out of the way. But one of the main examples of how that's got to happen right now, in my view, is protecting women's rights over their reproductive freedom. Uh, you know, if we care about freedom, uh, then government should not be dictating uh, choice to women uh, when I trust women to make those decisions. Other times, though, the only way we get freedom is if we had good government to step up, not big government or small government, but the right kind of government. And a good example of that is healthcare. I believe healthcare is a right. And I propose that we implement what I call Medicare for all who want it. In other words, we take a version of Medicare, we make it available for everybody to buy into. And if you really do prefer your private plan, fine, you can keep it. Because I don't think we need to order people to give up their private plans. Now, I think the public alternative is going to be better. And if I'm right, then more and more people are gonna buy into that. They're going to choose that freely and it becomes the pathway to Medicare for all. But we get there without ever commanding 150 million Americans to move away from the healthcare that they've got. Why would we, if we believe in the public alternative, which I do, why would we have to order people to accept it instead of just putting it out there and allowing people to choose? I think that's how we honor freedom and also get the job done. Another example of how we have to act together to deliver freedom is that I think you're not free unless you have had the benefits of a good education, because education creates the freedom to live a life of your choosing, the freedom to succeed. This is one reason why I'm going to appoint a secretary of education who actually believes in public education. And that means supporting teachers. Uh, that means supporting educators and professional learning communities. And yes, that means putting more federal dollars into the schools that need it most. Uh, so you see, we can organize ourselves around values that have very real and often very progressive implications. We don't have to polarize the American people around it. And I think that's especially important knowing that there are a lot of folks from rural areas on the call, uh, because I know that we can and should be winning in rural areas, but we gotta make sure that we're speaking to rural communities. I put forward a plan on building up rural economies that tackles the fact that we are losing health providers and hospitals at an alarming rate, in rural areas. Uh, it taps into the possibilities of technology and broadband uh, by uh, investing $80 billion to make sure that every American, either through fiber or through Wi-Fi, has access to quality broadband communications. Because that, in turn, is gonna be important, not just to facilitate things like what we are doing right now, but also things that we desperately need when it comes to mental health care, where telemedicine and telepsychiatry can help supplement in-person care.
Also in education, where we know that it is uh, possible to get people access to online courses and apprenticeship training, even if they live many hours from the nearest facility uh, where they can uh, enroll in regular college classes. Uh, so that kind of empowerment economically is going to be key. I also think we need to recognize that immigration can be a huge part of the solution in rural areas. My community in the middle of uh, the industrial Midwest in Indiana, we're growing because of immigration. We lost thousands of people after the factories closed. We're finally growing. But if you took out immigration from those numbers, we'd be flat, maybe even shrinking a little bit. And what I've seen is a lot of rural, including in conservative areas, a lot of rural communities have embraced the possibilities of immigration. So I'm proposing that we create an allowance of community renewal visas for communities that choose to embrace immigration, to qualify to get more residents uh, by inviting people to have a fast track to a green card if they commit to living and working in one of these areas that needs to grow population. These are the kinds of solutions that I think can help speak to people who, frankly, maybe haven't always heard our party's national leaders speaking to them. But if there was ever a moment to form new alliances, to invite people to cross the aisle, it's now. I'm amazed by how many people are coming to my events saying that they used to vote Republican, but uh, they're looking for a different way. And it's not because I'm particularly conservative. Uh, it's because I believe that we can do this in a way that's inclusive. And maybe I'll just leave, uh, close with this, because I do want to make sure we get to questions quickly. But I also think there's a crisis of belonging in this country. And it's being made worse by this president, but it's, it's deep. And only presidential leadership can help fix it. But we gotta make sure that everybody understands how they fit. As the economy is changing, as our demographics are changing, uh, we gotta make sure everybody belongs in the American project. And right now we see people singled out because of their ethnicity, because of where they're from, what they look like, who they love, everything from gender identity to religion is being used as a way to tell somebody you don't belong. Uh, we have an opportunity to do the opposite, but only if we have presidential leadership. I think it's part of what the presidency is for, to bring the American people together. And I believe we have that opportunity right now. It's a big part of what's motivating my campaign. Uh, so I'd encourage you to go to peteforamerica.com if you want to get into the details of uh, our rural economy plan, our mental health and addiction plan, uh, our health care plan, or anything else we haven't had a chance or won't get a chance to get into in detail right now. But having said that, very eager to have a conversation about whatever's on your mind. So what we do here, uh, we figured we kind of open it up to uh, let everything be just as fair and across the board. So uh, we haven't pre-screened the questions. Uh, we do kind of a lottery drawing. We ask people to write down their questions and we're gonna be bouncing around from area to area. And these are just gonna be natural unscripted questions coming from around rural Nevada. Um, I understand our Lyon County has a question ready. Are you ready out in Lyon County to unmute yourself? Yes, we are. Hi, Mayor Pete. Uh, first, thank you for your service to our country and for stepping up to run for president. I'm very impressed and, and uh, very, it's very heartwarming to hear of a candidate who has a faith but also leaves room for other faiths. So thank you for that. Uh, my biggest issue in politics is getting money out of politics because when I vote for someone, I want to know that they're beholden to me and not corporations. And uh, do you also share that? Because I think once we can do that, I trust the American people to make the right decisions on policy. Um, and do you also share that vision of less money in politics? And do you have a plan for getting rid of corporate PACs and dark money out of our elections and out of the influence of our elected leaders? I do, and I'm so glad you're raising this because it is incredibly important right now. We think of ourselves as a democracy, but we're not very democratic as long as dollars can outvote people. And so in addition to making the choice in our own campaign not to accept any corporate PAC money, uh, we need to have a legislative agenda from the very beginning that changes the ability of those actors to influence our politics. Now, some things you can do on day one. As a matter of fact, a lot of them were in HR1, this great pro-democracy, anti-corruption package, one of many good bills that our House passed and that the Senate is going to kill. Uh, we will bring those measures back when I'm president and work on them right away. Everything from making sure we have public financing that can help drown out the dark money, to transparency so that dark money isn't quite so dark, to other measures that are less around money in politics, but more about the ability to vote 
and to register to vote, which I think is critically important. Now, that being said, right now, uh, the interpretation of the Supreme Court uh, under Citizens United is effectively that corporations have the same political souls as, as you and I do. I don't think that's right. And if the only way to clear that up is to do it through a constitutional amendment, I think we ought to launch that debate. It might take years to deliver, but I think the most elegant quality of our democracy, the most elegant feature of the Constitution, is that it is designed for self-healing. It's been amended over 20 times in order to make our democracy stronger. And so that's really what it's going to take to clear up and overturn Citizens United, then I think we should be willing to move in that direction. I just don't think we should have to wait for that in order to take some of the steps we know we can do on day one. Thank you. Very, very cool, thank you. And now we have hands going up all over the country. How about if we move to West in Nebraska? Are you ready? I am, thank you, Mayor Pete. Um, this question actually comes from one of my friends who lives in Nebraska. And he wants to know how we differences or divide between rural and urban America. So it's a great question, and it's part of what I'm getting at with this question of belonging. Look, we have so much more that brings us together in terms of our values and increasingly in terms of our interests. The problem is we got a conversation right now that makes it sound like we are uh, going to have to be pitted against each other when it isn't really true. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you got a dialogue now that makes it sound like you either got to choose between uh, caring about a black single mother of three or caring about a displaced auto worker. Now, where I live, sometimes displaced auto worker is a black single mother of three. And we've got to make sure that we're uniting those interests together. Uh, when you look at rural America, these are some of the folks who are suffering the most from the current policies. Uh, the fact that there's been underinvestment in infrastructure, the consolidation that's going on companies clustering until, especially if you're in agriculture, farmers are getting squeezed both in terms of not having enough suppliers uh, for the, the, the materials and, and, and the seed and, and the chemicals you need, uh, to not having enough places to sell your goods. And that squeeze is getting even harder as a consequence of this president launching a trade war uh, that has, I think, a lot of farmers saying, uh, you know, how much longer am I supposed to take one for the team? Uh, and meanwhile, we got, we got urban America where folks are suffering as consumers uh, from that same policy. It's all linked together. Uh, I think we've got to change the dialogue so people can see how it's linked together. And another great example of this is climate. So I think a lot of folks in rural America feel like they've been told they're part of the problem when, uh, when climate is discussed. And so we shouldn't be surprised that a lot of folks are, are questioning whether they should be getting on board with aggressive action to deal with climate change. But the reality is some of the worst damage that's already been done by floods and fires is happening in rural areas. And it's certainly impacted agriculture in the middle of the country where I live. Uh, now, the other thing we've got to remember is that rural America can be a huge part of the solution. Most of the wind resource in this country uh, is already in, in rural areas. Uh, for those uh, in Nevada, you know how much of the solar resource uh, is in rural areas. And uh, I believe that sustainable farming techniques uh, are a big part of how we get this done. The capacity of soil to hold in carbon is enormous. We just got to unlock it. And we got a federal government that's as willing to fund farmers in sustainable agriculture as we are right now to pay farmers to not sell their goods to China. So that's just one issue where this is at stake, but it's an example of how, I think, frankly, my party's got to do a better job of explaining how these things are knitted together. The, the last thing I want to mention, national service. So one of the things that helped me get an insight into people from totally different parts of the country than where I was from uh, was every time we got in a vehicle in Afghanistan and got ready to go outside the wire, we had to trust each other with our lives. And it cut across the different stories and different politics for sure that we had. We just got to know each other better. I want every American to have that without having to go to war in order to get it. And so our national service vision is one that creates a million paid voluntary service opportunities per year. So that it becomes a norm, whether you're going to college or not, uh, to participate for a year in some kind of service effort. And I think the, the bonds that people are going to form just by virtue of working together on something hard is a great example of how we can knit together the fabric when we are way too divided as a country right now. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And now we are going to scoot across the country to Oklahoma City. Kurt, are you ready with your question out in Oklahoma City? 
Yes, I'm ready. Um, thank you, Murphy, for connecting with us. Um, this comes from Irene in Washington County in Oklahoma. And she asks, when you're elected and Medicare for All, who want it, is implemented, how can the legislation be written to prevent the insurance companies from letting go of their sickest and most expensive customers? Mm. Great question. So part of the structure of Medicare for All Who Want It is that if somebody falls into a gap, they are retroactively enrolled in that public alternative. Now, uh, that means that, that we create a place for everybody to go. Uh, I know there's that concern about cherry picking that goes on with the private insurance industry. The way we look at the math, if we're providing the public alternative at the scale that we think uh, uh, only this, uh, this federal option can provide, um, then that versus the private option with the profit requirements that a private company has means that the public alternative is still going to be better. Plus, we can backstop it with the kind of subsidies that make sure that you have a good risk pool. Now, that being said, uh, we've also got to make sure we're dealing with the cost side of healthcare. It doesn't get talked about nearly as much. There's a lot of work that's got to happen under the hood in terms of the way providers work uh, and in terms of the cost of prescription drugs. We have some ideas we're going to be rolling out uh, very soon that help explain how I believe we can get that done. Uh, those two things have to happen hand in hand in order for this to be a success. Thanks. Okay, and now we're going to go up to our center in Reno, Nevada. We have Beth Engels up there. Are you ready with a question from our center? Our, thank you, and thank you, Mayor Pete. Hi, Mayor Pete. Hello. Uh, my name is Steve Doc. I'm a recently retired university faculty member, moved here to Reno, uh, and as a gay man myself, I'm a proud time history you're running. A question, however, is about Social Security and what your thoughts are on what can be done to shore up the Social Security system so that projected shortfall and doomsday scenario that you often talk about doesn't come about. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is something that's on the minds of, I think, so many voters. And uh, at the same time, a lot of these doomsday scenarios, I think, are designed to make us think that we got no choice but to cut benefits, when actually if we make reasonable decisions about revenue, we don't have to uh, deal with cutting benefits at all. What we do have to do is make sure that we are asking uh, everybody to pay in. See, right now, the payroll tax that is collected to build up Social Security drops off uh, at a certain level of income. Uh, I believe we need to extend the level of income where we're still collecting that tax. Uh, if we do that, we make that simple move. Social Security is solvent uh, long enough, certainly to when I expect to be collecting it, uh, into the 2050s and probably beyond. Now, I also think we need to create more alternatives uh, to go on top of security, Social Security when it comes to retirement savings. And uh, we got a forthcoming plan on that that I'm very excited about rolling out soon that helps explain how we can make it portable in such a way that whether you're a full-time worker or a gig worker, uh, any way you cut it, you are seeing that contribution go in. Because I'm thinking about my own generation that's likely to uh, change careers more frequently than a lot of people in my parents' generation even change job titles. And we've got to make sure that our system is prepared for that. But I view that as a layer on top of Social Security, not a replacement, because that fundamental promise, that, that insurance that our country provides, uh, that sees to it uh, that uh, age does not lead to poverty, um, that is sacred. And by the way, the, the word entitlement, I think is totally misplaced here because this is something that you pay for. It's something that you invest into. It is an insurance program. We just got to make sure that it's whole for the long run. Thank you for that. We really appreciate it. And now we are going to move up to North Lake Tahoe. Do you have your question ready up there, Mark? Yes, we do. Hey, Mary. Hello. Um, will you please provide in detail for us your plan on how you will address climate change and the environmental concerns that we have up here? We're in beautiful Lake Tahoe and um, global warming is happening. We're past the point of waiting and seeing how it's going to work. 
how will you address that major concern immediately? Thank you. Thank you. And that's right. This is not a prediction. This is not a theory. This is happening now. It's accelerating. The scientists have warned us that we are about 11 years away from a horizon of catastrophe when it comes to climate. And uh, I see the little one there. Uh, in, order for, uh, in order for him to have a future, um, there is going to have to be incredibly ambitious action on this. Our plan, which you can read in greater detail from our website, guides us to being a carbon neutral economy by the year 2050. Some pieces of that can be achieved very quickly. Uh, one of those would be doubling the level of clean energy in the United States by 2025, which we are capable of doing. Then we move on to the transportation sector, starting with things like privately owned vehicles and evolving so that even uh, heavy vehicles and shipping become effectively net carbon neutral by 2035 and 2040 respectively. And by 2050, we've got an industry there too. Now, in order to achieve that, we're gonna have to quadruple federal R&D in renewable energy, energy storage, and carbon storage. And we're gonna to have to act to unlock every different part of America's potential to do this. That's what I was getting at earlier when I mentioned how rural America needs to be a big part of the solution. So does the military, which is one of the biggest purchasers of fossil fuels right now. But that means could also be leading the way uh, as the military has led the way in many different ways when assigned to do it by the federal government, uh, by, by civilian leadership, in order to help make sure that we're creating new markets for things like biofuels and green technologies. The bigger picture here, I think, is that America always does better when we have a national project. And this is the national project of our time. This is going to be as big as mobilizing to deal with the Great Depression or World War II or going to the moon. It's going to take that level of work from everybody, which means we've got to line up the private, public, social, and academic sectors. Now, the reality is all of the competitors for the nomination have plans that are gonna to try to get us there by 2050. So the real issue is how do we make sure something actually gets done? Because we've been talking about this for way too long. That's why I believe we need to invest and enlist the abilities of everybody to be part of the solution. Cities need to be on, in on it. As a mayor, I have seen how mayors, not just across the country, but across the world, sick of waiting for our national governments to catch up, have started banding together, sharing ideas, and taking action locally in order to make sure that we're following the Paris Climate Accord goals, even when the federal government is not. Although, needless to say, I would rejoin Paris on day one and treat that as a floor. And one other note that, speaking of Paris, this problem doesn't get solved globally without American leadership. And so we need to make climate one of the cornerstones of our diplomatic presence abroad. If we do that, by the way, it does a lot of good in other ways. See, if there is such a thing as climate diplomacy and it matters geopolitically, that's actually one of the things that gets us back on the front foot with respect to a player like China. But we can only lead the world in global climate diplomacy if we're actually practicing what we preach. And what we see now is the opposite. It led to the demoralizing site at the G7 conference recently of the leaders of the world sitting down around the table to talk about this pressing global issue of climate change and the US wasn't even there. We need to be leading on this issue, practicing what we preach, modeling that kind of development at home and making it a feature of our diplomacy and our international engagement abroad. Thank you. Uh, I, I kind of get the impression you've thought about some of this stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really appreciate that. Um, so now we are going to move down south to Pahrump, Nevada in Nye County. Uh, Nye County, are you ready with your question? Was my question as well. I, do you play golf? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. So for better or for worse, uh, one thing you won't be doing is uh, funding a lot of uh, taxpayer uh, golf vacations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now we are going to go back to Washoe Democrats. Are you ready up there in Reno, Ed? Are you ready to go? Yes, we are. Hi. Hi, Mayor Pete. Thanks so much for your time. 
I'll be real fast. Um, my number one priority this uh, upcoming election is to defeat Trump. Um, so can you just tell us why you are the candidate to do that? Yes, great question. And I think uh, it is the question for so many voters. I was at an event recently and somebody said, uh, you seem great, but I would vote for my neighbor's dog if I thought that was the, uh, the best way to beat this president. We've just got to win. Uh, here's the thing. We need a president and a nominee who is capable of standing up to this kind of uh, nonsense that's coming out of the White House without allowing him to change the subject. See, we're actually right on the issues. And I don't just mean that we agree with ourselves. I mean that the American people agree with us on pretty much every major issue, immigration, wages, even issues where we've been on defense, guns, uh, uh, choice. Uh, the American people are with us. And we need to make sure this election is focused on the reason I believe politics matters in the first place, which is how it affects your life. The more we're talking about him, the less we're talking about you. And I think he knows that. That's why when the economy starts showing signs of a recession, he makes sure that for the next few days, we're arguing about what? Greenland, whether to buy Greenland, right? This is uh, uh, that, that amazing ability to change the subject. Uh, that I think is is part of how he could win again. So it's going to require the courage to stand up to him, but also the ability to quickly put him in his place when he does something wrong, tells a lie, uh, whatever it is, and then quickly redirect the focus back to what we are going to do to make Americans' lives better. Because where I'm from in the industrial Midwest, a lot of people voted for him, not because they were fooled into thinking he's a great guy, but because they were ready to pretty much burn the house down because it felt like nobody was speaking to their everyday lives. Let me mention one other thing just about political uh, uh, tactics and history, because I'm worried that, you know, Democrats, God love us, sometimes we overthink this a little bit. And I'm worried we may feel a temptation to play it safe, which could actually be the riskiest thing we could do. If you think about it, every time Democrats have won in the last 50 years, it has been with somebody who is from a newer generation with a different kind of message, not too connected with Washington. I mean, we're going back through Obama to Clinton to Carter, even JFK in, in some ways. On the other hand, every single time that we have gone with the, the so-called safe choice, the person who'd been there the longest, uh, most connected to DC or most kind of conventionally strong uh, candidate, I mean, every single time going back to the 60s, we've wound up coming up short. So. The most electable candidate, I think, is always the person that we think will make the best president. And more than you would think, other folks who might have different party alliances and different values will come to agree. There are a lot of people where I live who voted for Obama and Trump and Mike Pence for, go for governor and me for mayor. It's not always about ideology. It's about presenting a different kind of vision. And I believe I'm the best candidate to do that. Wow, well, very good, thank you. And Mayor Pete, I'm flattered you're talking to us. So the first thing is, I have an 85-year-old friend whose name is Flossie May Heap. I am not kidding. And she says she loves you. And it, you basically, you're motivating her to stay alive till the next election. <laughs> <laughs> well, make sure to big, give her a big hug for me. That's great to hear. And better nutrition. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, so my I used to be a public education lobbyist in D.C. and Annapolis for Americans not for, for separation of church and state. Now I live in scary rural Idaho where nothing but Sam and the Bundy family. So, yeah, he lives about three miles from me. So my question for you in terms of public education in grossly underserved areas is mm -hmm. what's your plan or at least your thought on retaining and recruiting uh, the best teachers possible for an area, a really blighted area like mine. We're not that far from Boise, but we're a world away. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge issue. And we're seeing this constrain opportunities in a lot of rural areas in the same way that there's an alarming loss of healthcare providers. There's also a teacher shortage and underfunding of schools. Uh, it's one reason why uh, I'm proposing that we cut the teacher shortage in half uh, by making sure that we invest in what are called grow your own programs that encourage people uh, who are from communities to be incentivized and supported 
in staying there and helping them grow and making sure we encourage people to move and prosper in, in uh, these communities that are often also just plain hurting for population. That's part of why I think immigration is part of the answer. Uh, but we've also got to recognize that the teaching profession as a whole is under-supported right now. Uh, I, got, I get an earful about education every day because I married a teacher. And, uh, uh, you know, Chaston has shared with me some of what he's been up against in the classroom. And, uh, you know, some of the things that need to happen in education are very complicated in terms of tuning up a curriculum for some of the differences in the 21st century. Some of them are really simple, like we got to pay teachers more. And we are going to increase Title I funding in particular with an eye toward teacher pay, knowing that districts that embrace that are likely to be able to drive better results for their kids. We've got to lift up the profession. We've got to make sure that the Department of, of Education is an ally to teachers and to creating professional learning communities uh, around schools. And we got to invest in lifelong learning, uh, using different possibilities around technology to supplement education that is happening in the formal K through 12 context as people go out into the world and find that the, the demands of the world are, are shifting around them. Uh, there is no way that uh, rural communities will succeed. And, and I know so many people are, are expressing fears that their kids or grandkids just won't be able to live and prosper in the communities that produce them, unless we make sure we take care of the basics. It's infrastructure, it's health, and it's absolutely education. So yes, I see a federal role for that. I see federal dollars as necessary in order to address that, but I do think it can be addressed if we're ready, ready to commit the resources. Thank you, we really appreciate that. And we do have time I hear for a couple more questions. Elko, are you ready? It is really your turn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, hello Elko. All right, hi. So um, thank you for your service and thank you for running, first off. And uh, uh, the one thing I like to brag about to everyone, you know, is how you do your backyard fundraisers. I think that's really neat how you can do those. And uh, I got to admit, I'm kind of jealous. I'd really like you to come to Elko and be able to do a backyard fundraiser here. <laughs> well, I hope I get the chance. And in the meantime, I, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but I, I think we're about to open an office later on uh, uh, this afternoon in Elko. So uh, yeah. right after this, we're, we're opening up. office. We're going. Wonderful. We'll uh, say hi to everybody over there for us too, please. Yes, I will. But uh, yeah, so I just want to see if you had any plans to come to Elko and bring in the surrounding areas or not, or you know what we could do to get you here. <laughs> well, I, I sure hope we get the chance because, uh, again, part of what I love doing in this campaign is making sure we're reaching out to areas that haven't heard as much from presidential campaigns and haven't heard as much from Democrats. Now, that being said, we're learning just how big of a country this is as we try to cover it uh, and, and crisscross it. So we're also counting on folks who have at least had the opportunity to have a conversation like this or are in contact with the campaign in some way to help us spread that message and, and, and be that organization for us. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to uh, have a personal touch down the line. Until yeah. November 9th. And November 9th? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, November 9th is what we're hearing. All right. So, well, thank you. And we'll see if we can squeeze one more in. Ross from Kansas, are you ready with your question? Yeah, step on up under the. Uh... <laughs> hey! Wow! Hi, Pete. Hello, um, my name is Ross. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm 62, and 23 years ago, I moved from New York City to very, very, very rural Kansas to a town of 500 people. Great big cultural shift. And when I talk to the people who were born and raised there, two things that I hear consistently from the town. And I hear the same exact answers from small towns across America, which I've been to thousands of them. The town was doing well in 1970 or so, and then the interstate highway opened up nearby, and the main drag in my small town was the main drag in the whole rural area. And when that interstate opened, 95% of the traffic on that road vanished overnight, and within six months, almost every single business on that road closed up. The next whammy came when Amtrak, which had regular passenger service through that town, they stopped regular passenger service in my town and in small towns across America. Both of those things were things that the federal government did to damage rural communities across America. Now I know the interstate highway system ain't gonna go anywhere, but one thing that I never hear from any candidate is what will they do to massively upgrade our rail system in America? 
I hear lots of talk about the protecting the environment. We all know how damaging cars are to the environment. We all know how damaging planes are to the environment, but trains are not. What will you do as president to put the full force of the White House behind working with Congress to massively upgrade our rail system across America, returning passenger service to small towns across America, and reinstating fixed rail trolleys in our cities to help reduce our, our dependence on planes and automobiles? That's my question. Well, thanks, and it's, it's a really good question. Uh, I think the, the basic philosophical problem we've had is that Washington has this expectation that rail is supposed to pay for itself. But if you stop and think about it, driving doesn't pay for itself. We subsidize it by building roads. Uh, anything that uses fossil fuel from flying to driving doesn't pay for itself because we have billions of dollars in subsidies for oil and gas. And when we do invest in rail, we are investing in the economic vitality of communities small and large. This one hits pretty close to home for us because uh, in my community of South Bend, we know it would make a huge difference if we had reliable, speedy transportation to other cities. And right now I'm working as mayor on a way to get us connected up to Chicago. Uh, but the reality is the middle of the country has so much to benefit from having a well-financed and uh, adequate rail system. And as you say, it's got environmental benefits too because uh, rail can be powered uh, with clean electric means rather than relying uh, on the same kind of fossil fuels that are uh, hopefully less and less a part of driving, but inevitably a part of, uh, a part of air travel right now. Uh, so I do believe that with the right kind of federal infrastructure investment, we can do it. And the way I put it the other night on, on CNN was that uh, I'm not even asking for us to move straight to uh, Japanese level trains. If we just had like Italian level trains, uh, we'd be uh, light years ahead of where we are right now. And that would be a lot of opportunity for the middle of the country. Uh, so uh, I strongly believe that that is uh, a direction we need to develop and move in. I think it makes us all better off. We just got to change the expectations uh, around why it is worth investing in that, knowing that the returns come over a generation, but they come in our communities, they come in our environmental benefit, uh, and they come in the ability of uh, uh, people to live in, in different ways as uh, the relationship we have between large urban centers and more rural areas shifts uh, at, uh, along with an economy that's shifting too. Uh, I think you're, you're right on the nose when you diagnose that as one of the things that's very important for smaller communities to be able to thrive. And uh, it will absolutely be part of our vision on infrastructure. So Mayor Pete, um, it's obvious from all the hands that I have raised on this schedule that uh, you're very popular. So we would like to ask you to consider potentially an encore with us in rural America. Are you open to that idea? Oh, I hope we get the opportunity. I'd love it. Okay, so we will stay in touch with the campaign. We incredibly appreciate your time and joining us tonight. I look forward to meeting you personally in Reno in a couple weeks. So thanks again, and we will be in touch with your campaign. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate the opportunity, and thanks for what you do, especially for organizing as rural Democrats. I know sometimes it can feel a little bit lonely, uh, but just making sure you stick together, have each other's backs, encourage each other. It turns out there's more people who think like you than you would think. Uh, you just have to uh, be out there and make sure people know what you believe, uh, and then folks will find their way to each other. Uh, thanks, everybody. You've made me feel like I'm right there in your, in your living rooms and in your communities, uh, and I hope we'll have more chances to see you on the trail. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thanks. Thank you. Booty caps. <laughs> thank you, Kimmy. Yes, thanks, Kimmy. Great job. We will all, we will all be in touch. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>